So, oh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week uh, with the Communist Party. My name is Joe Sims, and I'm here with uh, Dr. Corey Marshall and uh, Scott Hiley. Good morning, both of you. Good morning. Doing? doing well. Again. Great. Um, we have uh, the great pleasure to welcome Dr. Marshall to our uh, program this morning. Um, you. Scott, you want to introduce her and tell yeah. her? Um, so full disclosure, I should start by saying that, that I'm married to Dr. Marshall, uh, but um, she's a, a 2012 graduate of the Latin American School of Medicine in Cuba. And you know that's something we can maybe touch on later in the program. Um, she's currently a, a faculty member in a family, residency, a family medicine residency in rural Pennsylvania. And her special interests are in women's health, obstetrics, and LGBTQ medicine. All right, so we're very good. glad to have uh, Dr. Marshall uh, on the show this morning. Welcome, and you graduated from the Cuban Medical School, right? That's right, yeah. Hats off to that. I guess that's <laughs> sitting where my hat indoors anyway. So we have uh, uh, a tremendous attack by the GOP on women and on reproductive rights. Uh, going on. What do you think is uh, behind that, uh, uh, Corey? What's your view? I mean, to me, the, the question of, um, of abortion and choice always comes down to the same thing, which is just a, a question of control. Um, I think it's just another way to control people's bodies and especially women's. But really what's interesting to me is that, you know, we talk about this like kind of new attack that's happening right now, but we haven't really had abortion rights I would say probably ever, um, but certainly they've been under attack for a long time. Yes. Even with them being legal everywhere, they're so inaccessible at this point that for most people, whether it's legal or not, it's not an option. So, you know, it doesn't make a huge difference. So while these latest attacks are huge and important, we still have, you know, we've been under attack for a long time and really have a lot of work to do to get women rights. Um, and it's something I see all the time in my own practice, just people who come in with the intention of terminating a pregnancy and it's legal, it's legal where we are, but they just, it doesn't happen because of so many factors that play in to getting people that care. So it, um, is, is part of this, uh, it, is part of this linked to the, the fight then for, for something like uh, you know, universal health care and... So absolutely, the, the things around, um, the, the struggle for universal health care, the struggle around um, certain care being, being mandatorily included in health insurance is, mm -hmm. is very much linked to this. So there's, you know, we have these great gains in terms of, um, with the Affordable Care Act in terms of requiring um, yeah preventive care be covered by insurance um, and requiring um, maternity care and requiring um, some, some things are like some issues around that breastfeeding rights for women. Um, so those were great gains, but we need to have gains that go beyond that, that talk about including comprehensive women's health mm -hmm. as part of um, those, those policies. So abortions should be forced to be covered under people's um, health insurance and um, access to contraceptive care and access to um, just general. Can you give us a sense maybe of how, of how that works in Cuba, um, how uh, abortion and sort of uh, reproductive health are handled? Um, well, I mean, Cuba is just such a different system. So they have a full um, uh, universal health care um, basically, anybody goes to the doctor, nobody asks questions. You're, everybody's covered, so there's no real question. Um, abortion is available um, in Cuba up until 12 weeks. Um, all you have to do is show up and be pregnant, and they'll, um, they'll let you do an abortion. Um, there isn't any kind of rules in terms of counseling period and um, ultrasound rules, and you don't have to, you know, pray about it or anything before. <laughs> um, and it's, um, it's, it's used, it's commonly used, I would say. Um, there isn't a lot of social stigma. There are certainly people there who don't believe in them or don't agree with them. Um, but the feeling there is you get an abortion if you want one, you don't get one if you don't want one and people kind of do their own thing. Um, 
it's it's a much safer system because um, it's very uncommon to have a, a abortion after 12 weeks in Cuba mm-hmm. because people go early because they know they know that they're accessible. And in fact, they do something that we don't even do in the United States, which they call a regulation, which is um, before you even necessarily have a positive pregnancy test, if you're, um, it's kind of like the equivalent of like the morning after pill. You don't know that you're pregnant yet, but you think that you mm-hmm. might be. They do something kind of like a DNC, but it's a much more minor procedure. Um, and so that can prevent a pregnancy from kind of implanting. So that's even safer than the abortions that we're doing. Um, and that prevents these kind of later term, more complication issues, so. And you, we, we, we keep talking with sort of framing this as uh, women's health, which, which obviously it you know, primarily is, but um, I, I imagine there are also um, uh, trans men who still have um, uh, a uterus and, and can become, so and, uh, is that, you know, is the sort of dialogue moving in that direction or? Um, I don't think it's something that we're talking about, mm-hmm. but it probably is something that we should be talking about. Um, it's definitely a, a larger um, question. So mm-hmm. there is there is certainly evidence, there is certainly episodes of trans men getting pregnant and wanting to terminate pregnancies or needing the same kind of health care that um, cis women would need. Um, and uh, I, uh, I had one last question on this. Ms. Joe, do you have anything that you want to ask? Sorry, I've been a... Go on, go on. Um, uh, so um, obviously this is, you know, there are, there are questions that are class questions and there are questions that are cross-class questions, democratic questions, and, you know, uh, the right to autonomy over your body is not strictly a class question. It's a question that concerns um, everybody, all, all people and, and all women, uh, in particular, um, but is there is there a class component to this uh, fight for abortion rights? Uh, is it um, does it um, and is there is there a, a specific way in which uh, working class women are harder hit, or working class uh, people with um, uteruses are are more impacted? I mean, I think it, it really does. So certainly, because in the, in so far, I mean, I think for poor women right now, um, there is already an abortion ban because people can't afford it. And so right now it's a service that's only available to certain sections of the population. Um, and it's actually kind of interestingly similar to what was probably happening before it was legal, which was the people who could afford to would go to other countries to get abortions or, you know, travel somewhere where they could get it. Um, But I mean, I definitely think that it is a way of um, specifically controlling working class women, giving them um, without, I mean, there's the question of bodily autonomy, but there's also just the question of like what you get to do with your life, being able to make decisions about, so there's this feeling that like the the um, the the question from beginning to end is about women not having control over what they do. So it starts with you shouldn't be having sex, and you know this kind of abstinence only idea. You should only be having sex inside the context mm. of of heterosexual marriage. Um, and then as soon as you violate that, then we're not going to give you birth control to help you prevent getting pregnant. We're not going to um, let you have an abortion to you know, prevent, you know, to stop this pregnancy. We're not going to, um, you know, help you with job training so you could get a job so that you can support your kid yourself. Like it's just constantly kind of throwing people into a, um, this pattern. It's kind of like, it's a punishment for not following through with like kind of the, the concept of what you should be doing as a woman or who you should be as a woman. I wonder if we can d- d- develop that a, a little bit, uh, Akur. You said that in your state, Abortion is legal, but there are a number of obstacles that prevent f- uh, women from um, following uh, uh, through. Um, in addition to not being able to afford it, what are some of the other obstacles that come into play? So um, I would have this is a slightly old uh, statistic, so I'd have to get the the cl- like the more updated one. But the last I checked. Um, I believe it was something like 15% of counties in the United States had a provider who um, 
would perform an abortion, which means that 85% of counties in the country do not have an abortion provider. Mm. So for instance, where we are, um, we're right on the border of Pennsylvania and New York. Um, in New York, the closest place that performs abortions is about a 40 minute drive from here. So that's mm. reasonable for people. Um, but in Pennsylvania, the closest place is about three hours. Right. And so, you know, I have patients and so we could send them over to New York, but if they live, if they're a PA resident, then they're not eligible for any of the, um, the financial support that Planned Parenthood offers to people to help them. So um, a lot of those grants are kind of state-based. So my New York residents are okay. My PA residents have to go to Allentown, which is quite a drive for us. Um, so that's a big one. Um, there's also the question of, of kind of the social, um, the, the kind of all the discussion surrounding it, uh, surrounding abortion. A lot of people who would really consider it a viable option end up not doing it because of kind of social pressures or family pressures. Right. And one of the big thing that happens, and this is kind of designed and you see this with um, kind of all these, these rules that, you know, you have to have like a two day waiting period or a week long waiting period and you have to look at the ultrasound and all that. Um, I'll have a patient come into my office and say, this is what I want to do. And then, you know, I have to say, okay, well, you have to go to this place three hours away and I'm not sure exactly how you're going to pay for it. And, you know, you should get somebody to drive you because you're not going to feel like driving home after that. And so then they come back two weeks later and they're like, well, I couldn't quite get the money together. or My car broke down and I couldn't find anybody to drive me, um, but I still want to do it, but I'm not sure. But my mom's giving me a really hard time. And, you know, my cousin is, you know, talking about how she could get pregnant and you know I just don't know and then they come back two weeks later and they're like well it's kind of too late now so I guess I'm having a baby you know and, and I see things like this with with 16 year olds who I mean there's a reason why 16 year olds probably shouldn't be having babies and part of it is because they're not great at getting things together you know like that requires some some skills like adults have difficulty kind of getting all those pieces together to make these things happen. So, you know, you're 16 and you're pregnant, you don't know what the hell's going on. Um, it's really a lot to expect people to, to see that all the way through. So I think we're, we're really limiting people's care already. And in addition to the political fights um, around uh, reproductive health and reproductive choice and abortion, um, are there, is there a sort of a, a fight within the, the medical community to, to try and make it more accessible are there so absolutely that's i mean it's a really interesting question and there's a lot of stuff kind of in the progressive end of the medical community around this issue right now um but there are two traditionally there, there are two types of abortions that we talk about and mostly what we hear about are surgical abortions which is the old like um, dnc which is still very commonly used but we also do something called a medical abortion um, which is basically just a series of two different pills that people take and then it kind of induces a miscarriage at home. Um, they're very safe. Um, they're very well tolerated for people. And a lot of people um, will choose to have that rather than a DNC just because the, it's kind of less invasive on your body. Um, those are actually really easy and pretty much, and I mean, any physician, certainly anybody in primary care would be able to oversee something like that. Um, but it's not really done that widely. And part of that has to do with um, kind of the regulations around the medications that are being used. Mm. So one of the medications that we use, very safe medication doesn't cause a lot of problems, but um, it's very heavily controlled. And so I can't just write a prescription for that and send you to the pharmacy and say, go pick up this pill. I have mm. to carry the medication in my office myself and hand it to you. Mm. Uh, and it's just part of the regulations about how that pill is, is kind of controlled. Um, but there's really no good medical reason for why it's controlled that way. Mm. And so making that pill available for a doctor to write a prescription um, to a pharmacy so people could just do that would enable someone like me to perform medical abortions or to oversee medical abortions in my office. And so that patient who comes and says, I can't get a ride and I can't get this and I can't do that, I would be able to provide them that care. And obviously, honestly, it's a much better um, type of care 
Planned Parenthood is a wonderful organization and I'm very glad that they exist, but in an ideal world, this kind of care would be integrated into your everyday care. You come in for your blood pressure check, you come in because you're pregnant and you wanna figure out what your options are. We talk about what your options are, we make a decision, you make a decision and I help you make, you know, I give you the information to make that decision. And if that decision is to terminate the pregnancy, then I don't have to send you somewhere else, I can do it. You can have it overseen by somebody who is a doctor that you already have a relationship with that you trust you know, who can really see you through any problems that come up afterwards um, and just kind of help support you through it. So, I mean, it's, it's something, it's a, another piece of legislation that we probably should be looking at in terms of changing the regulations around that pill um, and getting that to be something that's available. It's a basic issue of uh, access, but it seems that the right wing now with these uh, state initiatives are trying to make, um, uh, abortion and uh, choice an issue next year for the presidential election. And they're trying, in addition to throw it into the Supreme Court, where they feel like they have a conservative majority now that would um, get rid of overturned uh, Roe v. Wade. Uh, so it looks like if that happens, what will be the remedy? Legislative, will Congress have to pass a new Will they be able to, if, if the Supreme, I wonder what's, what's going to happen. If the Supreme Court overturns it, then where do you go? You know, uh, Canada? <laughs> I mean, what? I go back to those days, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it'd be, then it's a it's a state by state question, which um, re reminds us of the, you know, that 2020 is a big year for the presidential election, but we also need you know, a repeat and expansion of 2018 in terms of, of recapturing state houses from, because that, that's where the, the really, the, the, the right has been incredibly uh, um, sort of calculating and effective at uh, turning the states into kind of laboratories for the most extreme legislation. Just kind of, they, they have all the waiting in the wings and now they are just waiting for the Supreme you know, Ohio, mm -hmm. outlawed completely. You can't yeah. uh, talk about extreme. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and this is, uh, and it's kind of, I, I was looking in the, the paper this morning and we're seeing you know, more and more of this like gratuitous uh, unilateral, um, just changing of, of established policy. Um, the, the NLRB, uh, just the National uh, Labor Relations Board. You're yeah, yep. Yeah, just uh, um, I believe they they indicated that they're going to uh, strip um, graduate student teaching assistants at uh, private universities of the right to uh, organize. Um, so reversing. There's been it's been a back and forth on this, uh, mm -hmm. but um, it sounded to me like it was a pretty solid victory when we got it. But no, it's it's completely at the mercy of of the Trump NLRB. So a, a big setback coming there as well. Now I noticed that Planned Parenthood has put forward the slogan that uh, abortion care is health care, and they seem to be moving away from using the concept of choice mm -hmm. or frontal direct. Let's say what it is and fight for it. Is that your sense, Corey, as well? That that there's this uh, uh, change in language and in tactics and uh, more. Um, direct uh, addressing of the issue, or am I wrong about that? Certainly, and I think you know we try to get away from the 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 other side of pro-choice. For many people, is pro-life, and I think obviously all of us on the choice side would disagree very strongly with the idea that we're in any way uh, not pro-life. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, by you know obstetrics is a major part of my practice. And so I, I love delivering babies. It's part of what I do. But um, yeah, I mean, I think I think it is. And I think it's something that we should just, you know, we, we have a tendency to dance around things, but we should just say what it is. It's an abortion. We all know what it is. Let's just talk about it. Um, you know, the, the kind of, um, you know, the polling and stuff will tell us that actually most people are, are in favor of, you know, people having that as an option in their healthcare, whether or not they, you know, 
would do it themselves or, or regardless of how they feel about it personally. So, I mean, I think we need to just be, be outright about it and not hide. So, yeah. Well, great. It's going to be our action of the week this week. We're circulating a petition um, on, on this saying abortion care is health care. We encourage you to visit our website at cpusa.org and uh, sign the petition or check us out on our Facebook page. And we hope to have a meme uh, on the uh, uh, issue that can be circulated uh, amongst uh, friends and uh, family. So are you guys getting ready for the convention? It's coming up in a couple of weeks. Anything new on that front, uh, Scott? Um, just a, a, a lot of new, like we're in, in sort of frantic preparations all over the place. Um, you know, uh, we're gonna, the, the um, uh, resolutions that have been um, accepted by the resolutions committee will be published uh, early next week. Mm. So look for that on the, the website, cpusa.org. Um, We've been getting uh, just a really great stream of, of greetings from our, our fr international fraternal parties um, all around the world from, uh, just to mention, not an exhaustive list at all, but from the, the CP of, of Swaziland, from- uh, The CP in Swaziland? Yes. Uh, in Africa, huh? okay. Yeah, they, they, uh, they sent actually a really um, quite a, a lengthy letter describing their political struggles against the, the absolute monarchy. Um, yes. They have a monarchy in Swaziland that's in power. Mm -hmm. um, from, I've gotten greetings from, uh, from Laos, from Peru, from Malta. Uh, so it's, just, it's really, it's one of the greatest things about being a communist is, you know, knowing that there are these parties all around the world full of people that are fighting for the same things you are. Um, are we gonna have guests from other parties at our convention? Absolutely, yeah. I, again, I can't remember the, uh, the exact list um, and it's always dependent on you know, the ability of people to get visas. Um, but I believe, uh, get, um, Cuba will be there. What's that? Cuba, Cuba. Cuba, Cuba has uh, indicated that they are um, at least going to, um, to try to come um, again, pending, pending visas. Uh, uh, Vietnam. Um, uh, Vietnam. And uh, Die Linke from Germany, the left party. Um, that's yeah. Insane. So, um, and and other, I think ten or twelve parties uh, so far that have said they they want to send delegates, which yeah, is great. Communist Party of uh, Germany. Are they coming? The which? Communist Party of Germany. Uh, I don't recall seeing them on the list, but I again, I, I don't remember it completely. Okay, Brazil. I hope. Um, I hope they sent. They they were at our last convention. I, I hope. Uh, I hope they're, they're able to come again. Because What's the name of the president? Uh, Bolsonaro. Yeah, he and Trump are kissing cousins or something like that. <laughs> oh, and the, 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 the Young Communist League of Venezuela uh, will be sending a delegate as well, I believe, which is which really? is oh, Okay, that's interesting. And um, so any good pre-convention discussion articles that we should be paying attention to? You know, one of the things that, um, that's we've really been going back and forth on a lot, and you've been involved in this, Joe. Is this um, is the national question uh, in a, in a few different aspects? So mm. the the right to like what is a nation, uh, the right of a nation to self determination, um, but also the national path to socialism, um, uh, the the difference of uh, the path to socialism from nation to nation and context to context. So um, that's that's a really big issue. Um, uh, and I think it's it's especially it's coming to the fore, not you know not by chance uh, the um, as the capitalist class is increasing as capital is increasingly global the working class is increasingly global we're we're forced to confront you know a new role for the nation and you know part of what the far right is doing is trying to double down on a kind of reactionary nationalism uh, so that I, I would encourage people to to look through. Our pre-convention discussion. Um, yeah, I know you and, and uh, a comrade from Boston had a, an exchange about international solidarity and national paths. Right, right. We got an interesting letter this morning from a young woman who says, I'm a democratic socialist and I'm interested in what the Communist Party has to say. What are the differences that you guys have with us and what, what are some of the similarities, you know? 
And uh, so I say one of the similarities that we have is that we both favor um, a democratic form of socialism. Um, I think that our form of socialism is working class based. And I'm interested to know as a democratic socialist, do you support the working class in power or do you have another idea? You know, let's get together and talk about what we share in common and let's talk about uh, what we differ from and let's see how we can narrow those differences because we have to fight Trump and we need to find the greatest possibility for unity of action, not just with democratic socialists, but also with Democrats, just regular old Democrats. And there's a lot that we share in common with them as well, particularly when it comes to fighting the right and even some moderate Republicans, you know, because some of those are opposed to Trump as well. And uh, at the, well, at the same time, you know, I think we we can't we can't take that too far. We have to, you know, there yes, there there are certainly moderate Republicans who are opposed to Trump, including some that are the one at least is calling for impeachment. Um, the guy in Michigan. But at the same time, hey, I support that guy. He's very. No, that's, that's great. I'm very I'm very glad that he's done it. Um, and we shouldn't we shouldn't knock it. We should whatever. But um, we have to also. You know, I think, uh, you know, as as Marxists, as communists, we have to remember that the the goal is to put the working class in and insist on the working class leadership of the movement against Trump, of the movement against the extreme right. So it's not just, yay, you know, we're all in this together, which which we are in a sense. It's um, we're all in this together, but the working class is the most engaged, the most um uh, forward looking. We need more of them. I hope the whole house and the, he was one of the founders of the Freedom Caucus. Yeah, and he's got his own reasons for doing it. And we disagree with them on a thousand other things. But um, if it, you and know, the, the secretary of the education department, what's her name? Because they were one of the big funders. The Vos, yeah. Yeah, they've taken away money. Mm -hmm. So should, 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 should we have a uh, fundraising campaign for him to support his uh, <laughs> uh so you're not laughing <laughs> I'm not getting much uh, support well uh, Corey thank you very much for joining us this morning um, we hope to have you back again soon um, everybody we urge you strongly to circulate petitions around uh, uh, Planned Parenthood and its drive uh, to say that abortion care is health care. There's no getting around it. And if you support health care, you should support a woman's right to have control over her body uh, in, all, uh, in all cases. And by the way, there's a very interesting article by Michelle Alexander uh, uh, on this issue. Um, of uh, abortion and rape. I'm talking to her daughter about it, right? Daughter about it, yeah. It's a very moving story. She talks about her own experience and, and, and why choice was important for her because she was raped as a, as a, a law student uh, at Stanford and she didn't want to go to the police, you know? And, uh, uh, and so if she had, hadn't had the opportunity to to have an abortion, her life would have changed, you know, fundamentally. It's a very, very uh, important story. Uh, and there are millions of women with stories like that all over the country, uh, well, all over the planet for, for that matter. So uh, we'll see everybody next week, same time, same station, <laughs> and uh, fight the power. <laughs> fight the power. Bye. The ruling class power. Twice the ruling class power. Not a whole power in general. Just wanted to make that clear. Bye, everybody. <laughs>